We've got about a little over 30 people and more people entering the room. So we're just gonna give a few minutes before we get started, um, but welcome to you all. And thank you for signing up for this very important session that we're going to have uh, today to talk about issues of uh, racial justice in the United States. I see people still entering the room. All right, good enough. I'm gonna go ahead and, and get started. As I said, welcome to, to everyone who is here. I do want to cover a few uh, housekeeping issues uh, today. We have set aside 90 minutes for this conversation with Dr. Jason Williams, who is joining us from Montclair State University in, uh, in New Jersey. We've allotted 90 minutes for the session. Dr. Um, Williams will present to us and then we will have questions and answers uh, at the end of a Q&A session. You can use the Q&A feature uh, that's probably at the bottom of your screen to ask a question. And there are people who are in the background who will be able to um, ask, ask those questions um, at, at the end and we'll get Dr. Williams response. Um, I do want to remind you that this session is being recorded today um, and it's also being live streamed to, uh, to YouTube so that our alumni are able to view it also. So hello to our alumni who I'm not able uh, to see on the screen. Uh, without further ado, I want to remind us why we are doing this today. Um, Augustana is a school that has uh, five uh, faith commitments, and one of uh, those commitments is our commitment to social justice. Um, as I said in our email, a uh, flurry of emails I think that I sent to you over the past few weeks, um, that the recent national events um, have caused me, and I think have probably caused you all some pause, um, and to reflect on our faith commitments. Um, our commitment to social justice is, is very important to us at Augustana, and I shared with you that this is one of the reasons why I came to Augustana and I really love the way that we continue to live out our mission and, um, and to our faith commitments. Um, I'm gonna read a portion of our commitment to social justice. Um, Augustana College commits to making our campus and the wider world a more livable place for all persons by acting against injustice and intolerance and Augustana College seeks to embody the ideals of justice, peace, civility, and love in our institutional practices and relationships. I've asked uh, Dr. Jason Williams to talk with us today on the topic of the uh, racial and historical implications of the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Aubrey at the hands of police. And he'll talk to us about that. Dr. Jason Williams is the Assistant Professor of Justice Studies at Montclair State University in New Jersey. He is a passionate activist and criminologist concerned about racial disparity uh, and mistreatment within the criminal justice system. He holds a doctorate in the Administration of Justice from Texas Southern University. He is published in, in the academic arena and other outlets. Uh, recently, he has begun an ethnographic research on some of the most noted national contemporary incidents of police involved tragedies in the United States, specifically the death of Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and Freddie Gray in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, Dr. Wils Dr. Williams, thank you for joining us today. Uh, without any further notes, um, please enlighten us. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to say to you, Dr. Smith, thank you so much for the invitation. It is an honor, a pleasure, and a joy to be here with you all today and to be discussing this pressing issue. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. So um, again, today, what we're going to be discussing is the 
historical and racial implications of the death of George uh, Floyd Breonna, and Breonna Taylor at the hands of police. And what I want to do is really go over some of the historical implications. You know, how did we get to where we are today? You know, and sort of ground us in some of the historical um, contexts. So um, again, I am Dr. Jason Williams. I'm an assistant professor of justice studies in New Jersey at Montclair State University. And um, shall we get right into it? So the origins, when we think about some of the contemporary discussions around Black Lives Matter, for instance, the movement for Black Lives, I'm just gonna minimize this box, the movement for Black Lives, a lot of the um, discussions are falsely grounded, for instance, in a lot of the contemporary issues, right? So we don't quite know much, or at least hear much about the historical struggles, right? And so the struggle for Black dignity and human rights, they certainly date far back. I mean, we have to think a little bit about the revolt during the Middle Passage, you know, how people tried to escape the slave ships, for instance, right? How Black mothers threw themselves aboard on those ships trying to escape, you know, slavery and, and, and white domination and such. So historically, there have always been these historical um, and, and oppressive policies and these sort of extrajudicial social control strategies against Blacks, you know. And when you think about, for instance, what happened to Breonna Taylor, what happened to George Floyd, some critical criminologists and commentators would actually characterize these unfortunate murders as extrajudicial murders. So when we think about social control mechanisms and policies, certainly we have to go back to the period of slavery and the slave codes and such. Like I mentioned earlier, the Middle Passage, because we must begin the discourses here. And I think much of it is about educating ourselves about the totality right, of the Black experience. So the first African captives, of course, taken to Virginia, 1619, um, the slave codes, right? One of our first systems of racialized social control that has been that was codified into the body of the law was designed to control black bodies. And this consisted of the brutal control and punishment against slaves who dared act it against the status quo. And again, this was the sort of imposition of white supremacy onto the bodies of blacks, right? During this period. Um, the sort of beginning stages of the Black surveillance complex onto Black bodies. In 1808, Congress banned the importation of slaves. However, we also know uh, that the institution itself continued. Um, at least 100 enslaved Black people were killed, right, in the failed rebellion of the St. John Baptist Paris in Louisiana. But, you know, that's just one instance of a rebellion. We know that various more rebellions ensued right after that some of the rebellions we see today, right, are reminiscent of some of the rebellions that we saw take place back in the 1800s. Just a matter of how one chooses to characterize these incidents. We also are reminded of the Dred Scott decision in 1857, right, in which he, Dred Scott, tried to sue for his freedom. You know, the court of course held that you know, as a Black, freed or not, he had no rights towards American citizenship. So it is through the lens of policing that we begin to really see the subjective citizenship and perhaps even, you know, the inhumanity with which Blacks have had to sort of operate within the American uh, legal system, you know, the inhumanity even of how we are treated and how the system again sort of enforces white domination and ideology against black bodies. But I think Justice Taney's uh, quote, I think is the most uh, memorable, right? Um, output from that case is that, you know, he had no rights in which the white man was bound to respect. Um, after the Civil War, of course, you know, came the 13th Amendment. We know the Netflix documentary that many of us watched. And if you hadn't, you should definitely get up there and watch that which nullified slavery except for when incarcerated. And I'm going to sort of name drop certain um, sources as I come across them. Uh, Gloria Brown Marshall's book, which you should certainly go and um, look up on Amazon or Rutledge, I believe was the publisher, uh, Race Law in American uh, Society, 1607 to the Present, 
because uh, she sort of captures the history of the administration of justice and legal processes as it relates to blacks and, and other minoritized groups. Um, the next period that I think is important too is radical reconstruction. You know, the beginning was shaky. You know, it began during this sort of transition period, uh, post pre Civil War, so to speak. Uh, this was a period of intense violence and hatred. Um, race riots, once again, typically in the form of the white racist mobs, uh, rendering attacks on the newly freed blacks. Many of these conflicts resulted in hundreds of lynchings, right? Hundreds of lynchings. And really in response to, you know, black folk just seeking out self determination, you know, just wanting to aspire to be better, wanting to participate in the great American experiment wanting to engage in democracy. Black bodies would often hang on display, right, in these trees as signs of white supremacy and black inferiority. Many of the lynchings indeed involved law enforcement. And of course, many of them were under-policed. And this too is a theme in contemporary discussions around the under-policing of black communities. Um, just as we are over-policed, we are under-policed. And there are historical traits in that as well, um, as we see here. But despite some of the negative fallouts, Blacks were also being elected into public office, uh, believe it or not, right, in the South, and finding their political voices, something that they did not have prior to this moment. Um, their, but their liberty-seeking aspirations, nonetheless, um, fought by the K KKK with serious and extreme repercussions. Um, and again, that's, this was sort of the period in which a lot of the white um, hate groups came into fruition and um, pressure ensued, which brought about the 14th Amendment, granting uh, liberty and rights and citizenships and such uh, to the um, Black community, sort of giving more protections and such to us. But during this period, also, legislatures approved the um, Black Codes, right, which regulated and controlled free Blacks. And it was virtually a reintroduction of African Americans back into slavery, right? It restricted Black labor, Black movement, um, you know, think about, you know, essentially being reintroduced back onto the plantation from which you were just freed, right? Think about that. You were just freed from this plantation, but now through these mechanisms, you are essentially reintroduced right back onto this plantation through mechanisms such as the convict leasing system. Right. W. E. B. Du Bois has written about this extensively as well in much of his work. But Pig's Law and other restrictive laws regarding uh, land ownership and inability to testify against whites in courts and etc. were also used as ways in which to control black bodies. You know, these were some of the first uh, sets of draconian laws that attempted at controlling black bodies. Um, and, and they were primarily used to really feed the convict leasing system, which was the privatization of prisons at the time, you know. But um, the difference I would say here, because it was it was definitely slavery by another name, but the difference here is that many of the men that were cycled into this, right, siphoned into the convict leasing system, were worked to their literal death, you know, because under this system, as a planter who was buying into the convict leasing system, I didn't have to clothe you. I did not have to take care of you. I did not have to care for you as I would if you were, um, you know, my cattle, because of course that's how right enslaved people were conceptualized. Um, I can work you to your literal death, knowing that someone else can easily take your place, right? So I mean, the egregiousness with which right these bodies were handled is something that we definitely need to underscore. Um, the Black Codes overruled the adoption of the 14th Amendment, granting the liberties and rights. And of course, we know then came Jim Crow. And I should say parenthetically that in the North, you know, because we tend to associate much of the overt, right, racism with the South, but freed Blacks in the North didn't have it any easier in a large sense. I mean, many of them were being uh, kidnapped into slavery into the South, right? Um, and then of course, they had to deal with a lot of racism up North. So whether it was housing discrimination, employment discrimination, you name it, much of the same ideology uh, ran rampant up here in the North as well. But the, 
battles continued during the period of Jim Crow, right? Nonetheless, 1877, federal troops began to withdraw into Louisiana and other parts of the South. And we want to think about this theme of under-policing, right, during this period of time, because we sort of, as African-Americans, we came into this period thinking that we would have the protection of the federal government. You know, finally, we're being given rights, you know, and liberties. We're, we're having this moment of self-determination and, and, and what have you. Um, but nevertheless, the courts in 1883 allows segregation in business services, the complete devaluation of we as human beings, right? And law enforcement as an institution will have to enforce that law, right? Essentially, you have the reemergence of the vicious white supremacist rule in the South once again, right, through mechanisms of law. This is why Gloria Brown Marshall's book is essential reading. In 1896, of course, the Supreme Court sanctioned separate but equal literacy exams and other vote and exclusionary practices come into existence. All of these two are forms of serious, serious policing strategies. Um, throughout this era, Blacks continue to demand equal footing. Um, but, but again, as Carol Anderson in her awesome book, White Rage, which I also recommend, uh, she, as she, like, as she articulates, every time throughout time and space, Blacks have continued to demand equal footing and equal rights. And even in instances of change in policing practices, right, you, they're met with this sort of white rage, this backlash, right, this, this sort of, you know, hesitation with understanding that lived reality and that 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 lived experience the pain you know the antipathy if you will um but this period of time nonetheless allowed hate groups to grow stronger and push blacks further beyond the margin so as we move forward nonetheless jim crow was nullified by some of the civil rights acts um in the 50s and the 60s and, and of course, we know this is, as, as they say, law in the books, doesn't mean that we were able to legislate people's hearts and minds. But once again, nonetheless, Blacks would be met with unrelenting white racism uh, for winning some of the civil rights battles. And again, uh, Carol Anderson articulates this pretty well in her book, White Rage. Politicians, right, such as Barry Goldwater, Nixon, and other Republican politicians, all the way down the ticket, right, even in state um, legislatures as well, took advantage of white fears because much of the backlash, frankly, has always been sort of contextualized within the notion of white fear that, you know, African Americans will perhaps take over, you know, they will have power over us and do to us perhaps what we have done to them or what have you. Um, and so that fear is something that, you know, these politicians knew, you know, and they figured that that was something with which they could capitalize. So Bush Sr. is noted with using the racist Willie Horton ad, you know, to paint his opponent, his opponent, the caucus, as friendly to criminals. And we know going all the way back to the era of reconstruction, the label criminal has always been used against the black body, and in particular with black men as quintessential rapists, you know as that one individual that you always have to, you know, sort of, you know, hold back against, you know, white woman, because, you know, at any time he may come out of the bushes and, and rape white woman. Um, so they knew that as code, they could use this to play to the, you know, the white base and the uh, South who were largely disaffected, who felt, behind, who felt left behind, and they needed those votes. So moving into the sort of post-civil rights retaliation with law and order politics, um, anti-poverty and crime sentiment uh, designed to further restrict the upward mobility of, of black individuals also continue to ensue. You know, uh, the cultivation of various policies came into play, various policies, um, the surveillance of black freedom fighters. Um, I think Churchill and Wall's book is quintessential here. Um, Agents of Repression. This is a very important book to read. Um, you know, they contextualize COINTELPRO and, and different state-sponsored practices, even against the uh, American Indian movement and such. But here we begin to see 
the criminalization of blackness, right, and how it reemerges through neoclassical theories on crime and causation as social processes and explanations of rehabilitative ideals begin to lose influence, right? The reemergence, if you will, of that sort of old age, you know, Republican way of looking at crime. So no longer are we going to look at it through the lens of rehabilitation or through the lens of lived experience or you know this sort of grander, wider, macro, systematic, institutional um, context, but rather we're going to be a little bit more narrow-minded in our approach and individualistic. Um, there were certain scholars out at the time, like Martinson, who pushed the nothing works uh, mantra, if you will, that, well, there's nothing you can really do to rehabilitate those who come in contact with the systems. And the only thing you really can do is just essentially, you know, lock them up, if you will. Um, this buttressed the neoliberalism, you know, which again, buttressed the hyper-individualism, you know, and when you think about this, you know, we begin to hear these narratives around, you know, poor blacks in particular, you know, poor blacks in, the, in, in states of depravity as, oh, well, they're in these situations due to their own shortcomings, you know, and we begin to hear the bootstrap mentality or these bootstrap arguments, right, more and more. And, and, and frankly, we continue to hear them today. But when we think about these, you know, economic depravity, and you go all the way back to slavery and reconstruction, you know, the blacks were, you know, allegedly freed, but not necessarily given the tools that they were needed to fully come into society. That's where economic depravity and such began, you know, and there are a plethora of studies that have looked at the correlation between, you know, economic depravity, strain and such and criminality, you know, but with the black community in particular, we know that much of the economic strain and depravity and such has been manufactured and, and tolerated and sustained, right? But under this new framework of Martinson, right, and neoliberalism, the framework would be that no, um, none of that matters, right? The, the historicity, if you will, of their condition doesn't matter, right? It's nothing to do with history. It's nothing to do with slavery or like I mentioned, the historical depravity that has been placed upon them by the larger society and the government for that matter. And this was also a conversation that was taking place, and, and I have to say it too, within you know academic disciplines that have been charged with studying these matters. So this brings us to the war on drugs and mass incarceration, more so into the contemporary context of things. And you know, as uh, Michelle Alexander would argue, the new Jim Crow. You know, uh, when you think about a lot of the uh, modern day consequences of the administration of justice and its processes, you know, the institutionalization of police as proxy enforcers of anti-black policies. Um, you know, the war on drugs, you know, broken windows policing, all of the things that you see here, for the most part, I would argue, creates the context, right, for the Mike Browns and for the George Floyds and such, right, for police officers to be overpopulated in certain communities, um, for them to receive certain kinds of training that causes them to be anxious and, you know, always on the look and such, you know public housing restrictions, particularly in the 90s, that created this sort of zero tolerance mentality that actually, you know, forced scores of families out onto the streets for virtually minor infractions. You know, families that were impoverished, families that didn't necessarily have any other place to go, families that were generationally placed in, in public housing, you know? Uh, and, and we should also state that many of these policies came about through the collaboration of both major parties. Um, stop and frisk as well, right? Largely an anti-Black policy. Um, the anti-poverty policies that came about. Um, we also began to see sort of Black mothers within, uh, you know, impoverished districts be sort of painted as welfare moms, which, you know, pejoratively sort of paints them as, you know, these mothers who are undeserving of childbearing and, and help, frankly, from social services. This helps us to sort of devalue their humanity and by extension, the humanity of their children and therefore the, the entirety of the community. 
Um, and therefore, when police officers go into these communities and execute, you know, the overuse of force, well, why must we even care? So all of the above here creates the context for police violence and community distrust and the mass incarceration of black bodies into Americans' prisons, right, into our prisons, and, you know, as well as um, ensure monies, frankly, into some of the private prisons, right, the, the prison industrialization complex. But it also created a heightened visibility of racism within the criminal justice system itself, because through these processes, frankly, we began to see more and more the disproportionality, right, of folk of color coming into the system. So how does this relate to the uh, genealogy of American policing in particular? So most of our textbooks, if you are, um, you know, majoring in criminal justice, criminology or whatnot, um, tend to cite, you know, Sir Robert Peel and the London Bobbies as the blueprint of American policing. But as we've just mentioned a few slides back, with African Americans in particular, we have to go back to the time of slavery, right? Slavery was indeed a system of policing. It was, right? I mean, and frankly, we'd have to start with slave ships. We have to go back to the Middle Passage, right? But um, like I mentioned here, in truth, the American policing was born from slavery, the slave patrols, right? I cite Hatton down here at the um, below, Sally Hatton, who wrote a book on the slave patrols. That's another book you must look up. But it manifested in the form of the slave catchers, right? And the overseers who sought to execute white supremacist ideals that subjected blacks to constant and the most cruelest forms of surveillance. And when you think about the very essence of slave patrols, um, what does that mean to you? Well, I mean, what is the sole purpose of a slave patroller to capture and return a person back into slavery? Right? And this was the beginning stages of a law enforcement institution in America, right? And so Hatton's book looks at that, uh, you know, that she, she contextualizes the very beginning stages of policing through the um, modes of slave patrols in the Carolinas. So I would definitely encourage you all to look for that book as well. Understanding this genealogy requires us to, um, also expand upon the concept of policing, you know, as slavery in and of itself was a form of policing. Um, all forms of social control, as I mentioned earlier, is policing. So if we connect this back to um, public housing, where we had a lot of Blacks disproportionately situated there, if we connect this back to um, the toleration of economic disparity, institutional racism, and education and health care, we see, I think, the specificity of this right now during a COVID-19 crisis, right? And think about how that too sort of, you know, it, it, it presents as a peculiar form of policing when you think about the rate at which Blacks have died from that disease. And think about the effect of that on Black communities, right? The sort of discursive policing aspect of that. And historically, crimes committed against Blacks were not taken seriously nor responded. And again, we know this is, of course, reminiscent of uh, slavery, right? We know during that time uh, when people were lynched, nothing happened. We also know in the aftermath of slavery during radical reconstruction and regular reconstruction going all the way up until today, when people were lynched, nothing has happened. We also know in some black communities today, response times are, you know, very bad and communities continue to complain about that. So there is this sort of impunity with which the state operates uh when it comes to its failure to not respond to the to the death of black bodies and even to you know what some might call soft harms of black bodies so even in instances in which the black person was not murdered or not harmed severely there seems to be a lack of response um which again goes back to notions around well what what is black citizenship in this country um and of course with Emmett Till we know that um, although those individuals were captured and tried, they were nullified by an all-white jury. So when we look at the modern day movement for Black lives, it exists and draws from centuries of evidence, right? That proves the um, 
institutionalization of anti-blackness throughout American history. And it calls for us all to understand the intersectional reality of black suffering, past and present. And it's important that we contextualize within the historical um, contexts, right, of black suffering in this country. And through this, we understand why police violence should not be tolerated, but also how such violence is connected to those traces, those historical traces within the larger structure of the administration of justice and its practices of social control. So while today's policing practices may not overwhelmingly include overt traces or forms of racism, the research is there regarding the implicit biases, right, within law enforcement. And these biases are also symptomatic of a wide stream belief of racial stereotypes against Blacks. We're all socialized within this society that still largely possess, right, anti-Black stereotypes. Um, and we're socialized to think this way at an early age, unfortunately. Um, so the way forward, right, with using critical race and intersectional frameworks would be to think about how institutional systems collude and collide in ways that absolutely constrict the literal lives of Blacks and other marginalized individuals too. I cite here Crenshaw, Katanda, and Pella and Thomas's book on critical race theory because it's a collection of the, I would say the most uh, cutting edge writings that founded the movement in critical race theory. Uh, and again, this is a area of knowledge that came out of critical legal studies um, but I think much of the readings are definitely accessible to the public, and you all should definitely look into retrieving that book. And um, I cite Crenshaw's piece of work in the second line here um, around intersectionality, because I think through understanding her work, we'd be able to see the multidimensionality of repression and oppression and how although all Blacks are affected by police violence, um, as a society, we respond differently based on gender and gender identity, class, and other such social identifiers. And um, with Crenshaw's work, this is an article. So you should be able to go on um, Google or any search engine and find that. So the marginalizing the intersection of race and sex. You can type that into uh, Google and it should pop up. Now, the, the subtitle is A Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, uh, a Feminist Theory in Anti-Racist uh, Politics. So in conclusion, because I know we, we're going to get to the um, Q&A period, um, if the goal is to finally have a truly democratic society in which voices matter and are able to participate in the uh, American social experiment, then we must all engage anti-racist practice, right? And we're looking at Kendi's book here, right? Uh, um, how to be an anti-racist. Um, and we must do the hard work necessary to undo the centuries old systems that placed us in this current moment. So with that being said, like I mentioned, we must go beyond just mere traditional policing, right? But understand how all of our social institutions in some capacity operates as mechanisms of like I mentioned, think about racial disparities in healthcare and how the crisis of COVID, right, presented quite a striking reality to us as far as those racial disparities. You know, Black folk and who are disproportionately quarantined in urban districts did not have capacity to socially distance. How is that perhaps a form of policing? In New York City, we knew that when it came to ticketing, the NYPD, sadly, but for some of us, expectedly, right, um, ticketed more Blacks than any other group, right? So we need to begin to also expand upon our notions of policing, what does that look like and such. And again, begin to do the work, begin to do the work. Dr. Williams, thank you so much for that very um, educational and excite, excite insightful <laughs> uh, talk. Thank you so much. Very, a lot of information there. We are gonna move to the Q&A. We have one question um, by an audience member. I'm gonna encourage others um, who are in the room certainly to, to send your questions and we'll continue to, to answer them. So the first question that we have, 
One disturbing current trend is with talk show hosts and even religious radio hosts um, twisting Black Lives Matter as if it means white lives or other lives do not matter. How can we effectively influence the discourse to make obvious that Black Lives Matter does not deny that all lives matter, but instead calls attention to the inequalities and injustices that have been practiced on Blacks and other minorities for centuries? Yeah, I think that is an amazing question. And I think it comes through mechanisms like these, you know, having those discussions and getting educational material out there. You know, because another inequality that I mentioned in the slides too is around education. And I think unfortunately for a great many of us, we've been educated through systems that perhaps did not give us the full spectrum, right, of the knowledges that were out there. So for instance, you know, the true history of Native Americans, the true history of African Americans and such. And so a lot of us are knowledge deprived, unfortunately. And I think we need to have those real cutting edge discussions around people's true histories. So if we can do that, you know, and share readings and, and maybe readings that are very accessible, right? I think that might be a way to educate people around some of these issues so that when they hear Black Lives Matter and some of the other hashtags, they are less, you know, insulted by them. Yeah, the, the, the insults, being able to move past perhaps our initial feelings about that and the defensiveness Yes. to understanding the, the, the context, um, some of which you explained for us um, in your talk today. Thank you. Another, another question, you mentioned uh, over-policing and under-policing in, in Black communities. I want you to say a little bit more about that. Is it, are you suggesting that the same community can be both over-policed and mm -hmm. under-policed? Or are you saying some Black communities are over-policed and others are under-policed? Help yeah. us to understand the dynamics around that. Yeah, so over-policing can come in the context of, for instance, when you think about stop and frisk, right? So some would say, well, this is a policy that wasn't quite necessary. Um, if anything, it did more harm than it did any good because the vast majority of those who were actually stopped and frisked had nothing on them. And in fact, you know, there were several reports done by various research agencies in the New York City area that has shown that, right? And that in fact, when they pulled over or frisked uh, white folk, they, you know, they found that white folk were likely to have more contraband on them than people of color. And so this would be an example of over-policing, which may have disparate impact in communities of color that wouldn't really serve the government any good, right? This is going to build distrust, right? It's, it's, it's going to build poor relationships between policing, police departments, excuse me, and those respective communities. And then of course, notwithstanding whatever um, already existing tragedies that may have already occurred in those respective communities. Mind you, some of those communities might have already had a police involved shooting. So it will complicate already existing issues. Now, with the um, under policing, there may be some communities in which violence is real, you know? And so what we find in some of the literature is that when they try to call the police, they're waiting 20 minutes, 30 minutes for the police officers to respond. Um, you can see this in some of the domestic violence literature as well, where, you know, a woman is being attacked, but then now, and she calls the police, but then now she's waiting such a long time for the police to come and respond. Or for instance, a couple of years back, there were various reports, even within the media, where we found that the Chicago PD was sort of dragging its feet on trying to solve some of the murder cases up there, right? And so this is an instance of under policing, sort of not valuing the lives of black victims. Just kind of a, a follow up to that. You, you talked about the police response being slow and the solving of some, some murder, um, murders in some of these communities. You know, one of the things that I, I think we hear often is, you know, we can talk about policing and, and you mentioned earlier that um, black lives have been devalued for, for a long time. And, and I think a, a, a question that people often legitimately ask is, you know, what about black on black crime? Um, how does that fit into this discourse of um, this racial and historical implications of deaths of black people at the hands of police? But what about black on 
on black crime and especially in the context of not sur solving the murders at similar rates in other communities. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, if we go back to the Chicago situation, right, I think it definitely does fit in that. Most crime, of course, is intraracial, which is to say that most whites are right assaulted killed and so forth by other whites you know same with black same with other racial ethnic groups particularly because as a as a country we're still racially segregated so we still tend to live with people who look like us unfortunately right um but in a context of black folk who are eventually indicted and tried for let's say in, uh, assaulting or killing another black person if you should reach that far you are more likely to face some type of penalty and, and go to jail and such, right? So that is more likely to happen if, if it does reach that level. However, at the same time, there is still a devaluation of black victims in a sense, because in some of these jurisdictions, the cases are still a mile high, you know? Um, and you can look through offense types. So like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, cases, let's talk about, for instance, rape, you know, sexual assaults and such you know, against black women in particular, you know, so just the devaluation of certain black bodies and certain victims. And that's why I, I cited uh, Crenshaw's work too, for us to begin to sort of delve through the intersectional differences here, because it's important. But when it comes to black on black violence, just to sort of wrap up here a little bit, most black um, assailants will be convicted and, and prosecuted, right? And then there are also some cross-racial differences here. Like if a, if a black uh, offender harms a white victim who happens to be a white woman, oh, you definitely are going to be prosecuted and penalized, right? But it's not necessarily the case the other way around, right? So even within the um, courtroom processes, there are racial disparities, grave racial disparities across the line, whether that be with prosecutors and, and the discretion and powers that they hold, whether it be with judges and the discretion and powers that they also hold, also with the, um, defense attorneys. You know, sometimes there's case law and, and, and studies that have shown that defense attorneys are more likely to fight for you if you are of this racial background and class background and such, right? but also um, the impact from juries. So race just continues to play a, a significant role in how people are uh, adjudicated through the system, unfortunately. Fair enough, wow, thank you for that. Another question, thinking back to your experience as a college student and your own work with students of color, what do you think professors can do to help students of color feel welcome, motivated, and confident in our classes? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. I think grounding your students of color within your curriculum is the most important thing that you can do in this moment, but always and forever, frankly. You know, students need to come to college uh, feeling as if they to matter, that they are counted, right? They need to see themselves reflected in, in, every, in every way possible, but definitely within the classroom. I mean, I can recall even my own experience as an undergraduate, but also as a graduate student and going up through, um, sometimes not always feeling as if I counted, you know? And uh, especially in those disciplines where you have to sometimes deal with, right, the ills of society. And sometimes having to sit through lectures and discussions and hear some of the most, you know, unfortunate comments to be made about your community. And you, and now in this position as a professor, I say, man, you know, if they've only included some of the readings, some of the critical readings that, you know, would have captured myself and my community, you know, in the correct light, you know? So I think capturing your students within your curriculum and whether that be through readings, whether that be through classroom discussions or certain group type of um, assignments that you might give, right? Activities, guest speakers. I like to use a lot of film and documentaries in my classes that sometimes does that, you know, and then we have a discussion. I call it my little CNN discussions where I engage the classroom. Um, having, uh, I think, deeply participatory classrooms too helps to engage them. You, you know, students of color need to feel as if their voices matter on college campuses and definitely in the classroom. Fantastic, thank you. Questions keep coming. Uh, so the next question, our college has its own failures um, and some of my students have expressed an interest in addressing past injustices uh, and current ones. 
Um, so for, for instance, quoting from our, our uh, newspaper, our student newspaper, the Augustana Observer, um, we had a student uh, in the 1950s, uh, Chauncey Martin, who's one of the few black students who attended Augustana. Uh, he was fatally shot in one of our uh, res halls in his own room by a white student um, one Friday in, in October. Unsurprisingly, this questioner says his killer uh, faced no charges. This was part of our college's history. Uh, do you have some ideas about what you think are some appropriate ways to acknowledge this and to move towards a future as an institution committed to anti-racism? Oh, wow. I mean, perhaps constructing some type of statue or something in his memory, you know, uh, maybe a university holiday of sorts, you know, um, renaming a building in his name, you know, um, putting on a annual program in his name, you know, now would be the time to do something I think that is very material, right, to really concretize what he meant to that university and what he means in this moment and to you all you know, to sort of right that wrong as best you can now. Um, I'm happy to hear that you guys are at least talking about that. Um, it's, a, it's an unfortunate situation. It's an unfortunate situation. But I think there's a lot that you can do. It's Absolutely. Can do. And I'll just share to contextualize that, that a bit. We actually are pursuing that. We want to uncover um, the facts in that mm -hmm. situation. And so we actually are moving toward uh, having a historian uh, kind of resurrect some of that for us so that we know what happened and we can reconcile our past, right? And, and live out our uh, mission towards social justice and to be an anti-racist institution. So we are moving uh, in, in that direction. I'll be uh, leading a task force uh, to do that. So. That's excellent. I mean, even just moving in that direction and doing all of the things that you mentioned, just it shows a real commitment. So I'm happy to hear that. Few more questions. As a teacher, one challenge I face is that my white students badly want reassurance that they are okay on race issues. How do I create a space that is sufficiently safe without the reassurance becoming the main message? Without the reassurance. I think part of that, so what I typically tell my students, my white students that come to me sometimes with that too, is more engagement, I think, in the community, you know, more engagement in the community, but also with their own, right, in their own community. Sometimes I think the, the labor has to be pushed inward, right? So if you're doing, if you're doing an overwhelming amount of work within communities of color, right, I think that's where that need for reassurance, it begins to build. So it, I think it's a lot, I think it, a lot of it has to do with the surplus this sort of surplus need to give back. So if you sort of redirect that into other avenues where they can continue to give back and continue to do the work, that will help to kind of subside some of the um, need for assurance. At least that has been the case in my experience. And it is worth wonders actually. You know, many have come back and said, you know, I went back to my community and I proposed this idea and actually this is working, you know? So they just have an overabundance of energy, I think. Hope that answers the question. Great, great. With a number of family members and friends in law enforcement, it's been difficult for me to convince them that Black Lives Matter and proposed policing reform isn't just a direct attack on them, meaning white cops, but on the institution and culture instead. How can we support our black brothers and sisters and not ostracize our white friends and family in law enforcement at the same time? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's something that I often have to unpack in my police and society classes, my current issues in policing classes. And I think it's just re reminding them that, look, you know, we understand that you work in this profession, right? But at the same time, it is a public service oriented job, right? and that we the people do have the right to criticize right to demand certain things from the from the profession and such and you, you know the profession is not above reproach it's going to come with the territory right 
And I think having that deep seated and tough, often tough conversation, listen, I have friends and family in police as well, and I've had to have these conversations, but having that conversation and sort of reminding them of that in a nice little way, I think does the trick. Because let me just say really quickly, I think as a profession over time, and really because of how sadly the ruling class has used the police as a control mechanism of the quote dangerous classes, we have allowed that mindset to sort of grow within that profession. And, and by mindset, I mean that they are above reproach in a sense, you know, but I think we need to remember that, you know, as an institution, they work for we the people, right? And so just like a politician, just like any other state representative, we the people are going to have critiques, we the people are going to have demands, but you know, there is this sort of bifurcation here, right, with certain people in society who have not been given the full rights and ability to demand from government. And so it is a messy, messy situation, but you have to continue to work through it and you have to continue to try to talk, right? And build empathy and sympathy and connections with our brothers and sisters who are in the profession. Many of them will come through it. Many of them will understand. I think too that your, your conversation today and helping us to understand the institution um, has been helpful uh, as we try to unpack some of that. And it's that people represent this institution that has historically, as you've said, devalued right black bodies and and um, and the black experience. And so when we ref when we represent institutions like that, sometimes the the, the anger um, that people have feels like it's placed on individuals when that's right. Um, really, it's it's directed toward an institution that has been oppressive for a long time. And, and understanding too, because one thing that I often say to some of my friends in, it, in, the, in, the, in the institution too, is that, look, I understand that it's not all on policing, right? But that for a very long time, the institution has been enforcing policies and laws that has been imposed even upon them by politicians, right? So there's a lot of blame that, that that's there to go around, you know? So I think those deep, deep seated conversations must be had, but again, with the understanding that everything we went over today must be also included in that conversation. Mm. Yeah. The next one is a, is a statement really, and it, it's really focusing a little bit more on, on politics um, and maybe the politics around policing. And uh, so I'll just read the statement. And if you want to respond, uh, I, I'm sure people would appreciate it. I struggle to understand the political po polarization that comes to be associated with ideas that should transcend politics, for example, justice, mercy, et cetera. Many of our students are coming to us from conservative households. How can we help our students move beyond the limited views imposed by politics to encourage their understanding that these ideas are far more nuanced than if you're a conservative, you should support the police? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question uh, and statement, right? What I do is I use a lot of qualitative and ethnographic research in all of my classes. Because for me, it's about building empathy, right, in my classes. And look, I get my share of students that are from those types of households as well, you know, despite being in northern New Jersey, you know, they typically say, oh, the Northeast, right, is a bastion for um, progressive liberalism or whatever have you. Um, but be that as it may, um, I think when we're teaching around some of these issues, right, in particular, it should be about trying to connect with them at a level where you can build empathy and understanding. Uh, many of the students are coming to the university, um, like you mentioned, from backgrounds where they were not taught to think about these issues in very deeply critical ways. And again, notwithstanding whatever their political views may be. Now, I have had students who come into any one of my classes, right? And in the beginning, they're like, oh, bootstrap mentality, right? Oh, mm -hmm. you know, hyper individualistic thinking and such. But after they've read through some of the readings that I've uh, imposed, right, <laughs> on the syllabus, or after we've watched some of the documentaries and the movies and the films, because that's another way that you can get them to sort of disconnect from the outside world and to, and to really think critically right? You begin to see a difference in how they see things and at least in how they might look at some of these issues. I think we have, as teachers, we have to use materials that builds empathy 
and this might require us to move away from some of the traditional programming that we've long used. You know, we may need to use a lot more technology, multimedia sources within our classrooms, you know, and especially with this generation of students too, you know, there are a variety of documentaries and films, movies, right, and such that you can use that will easily do that job. Um, I've had students whom after watching certain things and reading certain things in my classes, they've cried, you know, because it, 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 it hits you. So I hope that helps you there. Thank you so much. Our next question begins with the statement, thank you for this excellent presentation. You've recommended several valuable resources. What one resource would you suggest for college administrators to best understand how we got to where we are and what we as college administrators can do to set a new and better course? So a particular I resource. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I, I definitely think that um, the Gloria Brown Marshall book, right, in particular, I think, because it gives us a, a stunning, stunning picture of a lot of the, um, you know, racist mechanisms within the uh, administration of justice, right, from 1607 to now. I think it's going to be important that we understand that, because I think it definitely dovetails, right, some of the issues that students are coming onto campus with. So grounding ourselves in the holistic understanding of those inequalities that some students are bringing with them to campus is crucial, right? For any uh, college administrator, you know, really understanding the deep seated uh, implications around diversity inclusion, as opposed to like the surface level stuff, right? That, okay, so we understand that we have, you know, these many blacks, these many Hispanics, so we need to do this, that, and a third. No, I think really delving into what the uh, concerns are for these students is, is crucial. Um, I, but I also will say, I think that some of the tools that you have are already on campus, right? And, and that is going to be the students that attend your university, right? The students that attend your college. Listening sessions with your very own students, you know? I'm a qualitative uh, researcher and methodologist, so I deeply believe in understanding and, and, and analyzing people's lived experiences. So I think listening sessions with the students that are on your very own campus will go a very long way. You know, listen to those students, understand where they come from, what are their needs, what 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 you know, what traumas are they bringing with them. You may find that many of them are multi-dimensional, right? Um, those are your very your very best resources right there on campus. Fantastic, thank you. You mentioned earlier in your presentation. And um, in a response to, I think, two questions ago, the bootstrap mentality. Can you speak more about the danger of the bootstrap mentality? Yeah, it individualizes Black suffering, um, so-called Black inferiority, right? And, 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 and other forms of, you know, um, what I would call malign neglect, right? Um, within the Black community. Um, and it, what it does is it also whitewashes, if you will, too, the, um, like we said, centuries old, um, you know, white supremacy that has been imposed upon Blacks since the Middle Passage. And it is very, very dangerous, you know, very, very dangerous. Because like I mentioned, um, for instance, people in urban, urban, the urban community, for instance, right, you know, when you compare, you um, Black upward mobility in these communities to, let's say, the uh, Asian community, and we know this often happens, right? Like the, the the model minority myth, right? Mythology, and there are some pains that comes with that as well with that community and such. But when you do that, you're comparing apples and oranges, right? And it's very dangerous here because it it discounts the reality that since we've been here as African Americans. We have been sort of, you know, as, you know, figuratively speaking, well, literally speaking, the knees have been on our necks in a sense, right? Completely, completely blocked from full participation in American society and all of its institutions. And so when you're comparing us to, you know, Asians and saying, well, they came here and they were able to do it and you can't do it it depletes all context, it, it, all, all historical context along with histor uh, contemporary context, excuse me. And so it is very dangerous. And it also supposes the fact that, you know, Blacks are not trying and Blacks are not doing what they um, need to do to try and, you know, 
get better foot. When in reality, for those of us who do make it, right, we had done so against tremendous odds, tremendous odds, right? Tremendous odds, putting in 10 times the amount of work just to get to where we are, right? And so what we're asking is that, you know, can we, can we ever reach a reality or a day in which we don't have to do that, right? We don't have to do that. And so the bootstrap mentality is horrendously dangerous. It's, it's horrendously dangerous. Um, and it's dangerous, I think, against all of us, right? Because it gives white folk a false sense of superiority, right? And it harms Asians with the myth of the model minority, right? I mean, there's studies and literature around, you know, suicide rates in that community, right? Because, you know, you have kids trying to live up to that. So it's, it's a very dangerous, dangerous term to use. Well, that's powerful. Thank you. Um, as you've eloquently elaborated, the foundation of racism is cultural, economic, and political self-interest. I don't think we can tackle racism without talking about self-interest. Can you share a bit about how, we, how do we move forward challenging or dismantling our own self-interest? Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of that has to do with looking in internally, as you sort of alluded to a bit here, and really having to ask ourselves, you know, do we really want to live up to the expectations of our founding documents? You know, and how do we do that um, within a pluralistic society? You know, we have to we have to have these deeply philosophical um, conversations, you know, and even look beyond super patriotism, you know, Michael Parenti's book talks a little bit about this. We have to go beyond, you know, the facade of American exceptionalism, you know, that have, those days have to be over. I don't think we can um, any longer really ride on those mythologies with the advent of technology, the advent of Twitter, you know, Facebook, now TikTok is a thing, right? Because now people all around the world can see us for who we are. And I don't think we can, you know, any longer can we hide behind American exceptionalism. So I think there needs to be, and particularly in this moment, there needs to be a lot of inside conversations. I think a lot of us need to sort of, you know, come into our secrecy, as I like to say, and have those conversations internally with our families, with our friends, and really begin to sort of decide what kind of society do we want to be? You know, is the Constitution a reality? You know, when we think about the Declaration of Independence, is that true? You know, do we really want that to be what it say it is? Because people in China, they are looking. People in Russia, they are looking. People in Cuba, they can see what is going on, right? So the two-facedness with which we have long lived is over. Next question, uh, another disturbing trend is tone policing Black Lives Matter protests, dismissing justified anger among Black folks as irrational and unlawful. The stereotype, for example, of the angry Black woman, for instance. Um, Martin Luther King seems to be a figure routinely appropriated by white folks to tone police uh, Black responses to systemic racism. Could you speak to the role of anger in affecting positive social change for black for black communities? So that so that so so police in tone and how we react to. So the the question is really about how people are trying to to tone police the Black Lives Matter protests. So oh, oh, that okay. why are they so angry? They shouldn't do this. Yeah. They shouldn't do that. Really, yeah. A, yeah. And that has been a big thing lately too. And. Um, it's, it's bothersome to some extent, right? Because like I mentioned, you know, the anger, right? That many of us have in the community stems back to the middle passage. And I think that people need to be able to get that out. People need to be able to have space to, you know, grieve, you know? And so to me, it, it's, it's, it's extremely bothersome, you know, it's, it's, it's bothersome. You know, people need, so I know, for instance, I was on a call the other day and people had issues with, um, you know, the hashtag defund the police and such, right? But what I will say is I don't think that people outside the affected community, um, you know, should have voice in telling, you know, again, the affected folk, these, you know, historically disadvantaged and colonized individuals, how to, you know, respond to oppression, you know? And I think, again, that comes to, 
that comes from really having those deep seated internal conversations about your positionality, right, in all of this. You know, so my answer to that would be to just allow these people, right, who these affected communities to grieve and to think about the language that they want to use. Because understand, whatever language that they are using, it is grounded in their pain, right? It is grounded in their lived experience, both past and present. So you just mentioned uh, the defund the police. And we have a couple of questions about that. I'll try to put them all in one. Um, first, can you share a little bit, what do, what do people mean when they say um, defund the police? What are your thoughts on, uh, on that, that movement? Um, some have called for defunding police departments and increasing the use of social workers. Um, mm -hmm. And thirdly, um, how might um, defunding the police impact the dynamics that you've discussed? Yes, yeah. So I think you pretty much captured a good portion of that. Um, the defunding the police initiative would pretty much redistribute a lot of the funds to community-based resources. So social workers for one, um, but also when you think about recreational facilities, right? And how over the past couple of years, they have been defunded and, and frankly obliterated in certain jurisdictions. So when you look at the literature around the utility of community centers and such, they work. They definitely seem to work. And like I mentioned on the other call the other day here in New Jersey, uh, I work with the uh, New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Um, and we've been sort of drafting some plans around this with the juvenile justice system here um, with trying to get our government here to understand that, look, we can best approach juvenile justice by redirecting funds and the focus around rehabilitating our youth in the community from which these youth come. Okay, the research is very clear about that as well. And let's put it in further context. Um, if let's say this kid's family is in Newark, right? And, and, and Essex County is in Northern New Jersey and they commit a lot of their share of youth into our juvenile justice system. So if the vast majority of these families have to go from North all the way down to South Jersey, that can be a huge economic strain on these families, right? And then not to only mention that, you know, what are these youth coming home to with, you know, are they coming home to any, you know, uh, opportunities, but then are they coming home with any skill sets and such. So what the research tends to show is that it's best to rehabilitate them to give them skill sets in the community from which they come, you know, and then the intangible resources and effects of having received these resources and skill sets in your community. Right? So there's this sort of attachment effect that also ought to matter here. Mm -hmm. But then also the effect of allowing a community to have voice in how it is to be governed, right? And that kind of goes back to the, my earlier contentions around, you know, democracy and inclusion and such. Fantastic. Another question from a, a faculty member who takes part in the education of young people about these mechanisms of racism. And this faculty member says, I often encounter students who ask, how as an individual can I help now that I know how history influences the present practice of injustice? And this faculty member wants to know, how would I direct the question? So how, how can they help now that they know the history? Yeah. I, in a variety of ways, right? So you can help in advocacy circles. You can help, obviously, through your um, the political process, right? <laughs> but certainly in advocacy circles, um, you can. You're you're a faculty member, right? That kind of you know has power in and of itself. So you can help uh, within the university community, right? With different kinds of programming and such. Um, so you can help in a variety of ways. You know, you can help by responding to the needs of affected communities on the campus, uh, hopefully primarily students, right? But understand too that there are faculty and staff on your campus who could definitely use your help, you know, as you continue to learn more about their plight. So um, I'm just happy to, to know that, you know, you're willing to help. Thank you. We have three more questions and they're all kind of centered around uh, possibilities, wanting to know your professional opinion about possibilities. Um, in, in The Daily, which is a podcast, in The Daily podcast today, the topic was on the unnecessary use of deadly force on Rashard 
Brooks, the, the man that was killed in uh, Atlanta at a Wendy's drive-thru uh, just a few days ago. Um, what are other suggestions beyond de-escalation training that might have saved Brooks' life in that situation? This person says, my view is that an officer should have walked um, Rashard to his sister's home, as he suggested, but in today's ethos of police force, that would not even have been considered. What might be other suggestions yeah, how so that could have been handled? Yeah, some suggestions around the sort of abolition and defunding circles are that you could have community-based responders. And believe it or not, these are already exist, right? So you have the violence interrupters, you know, um, you have, so in a variety of different capacities, they already exist. And these people will go out and sort of respond instead of officers, right? I mean, and one thing we have to get, I think, um, we have to get correct here is that for some communities, police kind of bring with them a, a, a kind of visceral violence that just doesn't seem to work in some of these communities, right? And unfortunately, this is what we're seeing, right, in this moment. So whether you're looking at Brianna, right, George, it doesn't matter the case. What we see is that when you deploy police officers in these communities, in these with these particular uh, situations, they don't tend to fare well. So the discussion now is about how might we empower the community itself to, you know, step up to the plate and begin to, to step up, excuse me, to the plate and begin to police itself. And I think that, you know, there are various possibilities for that. I think we just have to have the will and the courage to imagine it. And it's okay for us not to fully know what that might look like right now. That's okay, right? That's okay. But what we do know, however, is that the institution of policing as it currently exists is not working for some communities, right? And that it has been viscerally violent. And so something needs to change. Something needs to change. The courage to imagine. What a powerful statement, partic particularly for a, uh, an undergraduate liberal arts college where we're always challenging our students, right, to, to, to get into the fray of things and imagine, reimagine the world and reimagine themselves. Uh, and this is certainly one of those times when uh, I, I think that's really sound uh, advice, a challenge, uh, but very sound ad advice. Um, we have another question. Do you think the current movement is at all different from previous uh, uprisings such as Ferguson in 2014, Los Angeles in 1992, and, and many others. Do you think that we'll see real change this time? Yeah, I think it is certainly different. I mean, the, it's largely multiracial. I mean, you see a lot more white Americans out there. I mean, I've been to several already. I've been asked to speak at a couple. And whew, you know, this is incredible. I have to agree with President Obama, right? Unlike something we've never seen before to some extent. Um, and it's persistent, right? Like, I mean, they've been out consecutively with this. So I do definitely think that the response, right, has, has definitely been um, something that is different and that's catching a lot of people's eyes, even those who might not necessarily be for, right, um, police reform and such, the sort of um, Blue Lives Matter crowd, if you will. Now, on the question of will we see uh, change, we're already seeing it, right? So LA, New York, uh, Minneapolis, and some other cities have already begun to redistribute funds from the police and budget to community-based uh, communities and, 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 and assets and such. So we're already seeing it. Um, and in other jurisdictions, the conversations are being had. Um, there are also some conversations around police unions and such that are beginning to take place. So. And politicians too are starting to talk a little bit more about it, I think in more forceful ways. So we are beginning to see some changes. And I think too, that um, we're in a very hot seated political moment, right? We know that some major elections are coming up. So I think that too will have an effect on how things will move forward with this uh, policing issue, reform or whatever you wanna call it, yeah. We just had a, a new question uh, uh, added, how do we reconcile right versus wrong and lawful versus unlawful, specifically concerning the actions of the protest? So I, I'm, I'm gonna guess that maybe they are referring to the looting and the, the fire setting and whatnot. 
that's what I'm, I'll respond to that because I'm guessing yeah, I don't I don't have that context but how yeah. you make sense of it I think yeah. it'll be fine it's really yeah because that's what I'm yeah that's how I'm gonna make sense of it um yeah I mean it's an interesting question I do know that based on some of the reports so far a lot of the fight the fire setting and looting and such was well let me start with the fire setting a lot of the fire setting primarily started by people who weren't part of the organizing efforts, right, around a lot of the protests. So at least according to many of the reports, and it's unfortunate because it does have an effect on sort of devaluing the very reasons as to why people are out there. And those reasons are, um, you know, couched in fact, right? They are real reasons, you know. So um, now as to a lot of the looting, also to some extent, you know, unfortunate, but I, I, would, I would caution us to think a little bit more grander in that as well, as far as, like I mentioned, some of the uh, sustained economic uh, inequalities and such, right? There was another video that was matriculating around Twitter and, so, and broader social media too, not too long ago of another um, organizer, black woman organizer who was helping to contextualize a lot of that. And we got to think about like, why did a lot of those people, why, what, what made them want to go out there and do that? Not, not justifying it or whatnot, but what made them feel that in that moment, they had to take advantage of going into targets or whatever store that they had went into to, you know, take advantage of the, the looting. You know, what does that say about our society that in that very moment, people felt the need to go in there and do that? And largely people who are impoverished, people who perhaps do not have, you know, I think that too is a damning statement on we as a, uh, you know, economically challenged society, right? Or economically unequal society. Um, so I would just sort of, you know, repackage that question and throw that back at, you know, we as a society many of them largely college students, you know. Wonderful, Wonderful. thank you. Um, questions continue to come. And so since we've got a little more time, I'm just gonna continue to take them. Um, can you speak more about the intersectionality of identifiers and what we as an institution and as individuals can do to better support some of the most vulnerable people? So for example, trans women of color. Yeah. yeah. So I know as an institution, we need more courses around it, right? More courses and more um, speaking opportunities around this, you know, whether you do programs or what have you. So I'm here at Montclair. I'm also affiliated with our um, gender studies and women's studies program. And I taught a class on, uh, so first I did Black Lives Matter. And this was in my regular department. And after I did my Black Lives Matter course, students said, okay, we need something more. You, need that. you just can't do that and, and leave us with that. We need something else. And so then I did State Violence Against Women of Color. And in that class, I used Andrea Ritchie's book. So, and in her book, she contextualizes a lot of, you know, the uh, intersectionality of, you know, the violences that have occurred against women of color. You know, so I think including a lot more of the materials out there around the violences that occur against women of color. But, but again, primarily in your question, as you mentioned, trans identified individuals, uh, it is crucial. You know, uh, even in the movement, you hardly hear anything about it. And that's unfortunate, that's unfortunate. But not only I would say the violence that, you know, comes from the state, but also interracial violence, right? Just everyday violence in, in the community itself. So there needs to be a much larger reason of consciousness around some of these issues. And I think as an institution that's supposed to serve as the conscience of society, um, we definitely need to take that on. We should be taking that on more boldly. Yeah, certainly when we consider the intersections of identities um, and looking at the whole person, we realize that there are some of us who will face double and triple jeopardy because right. of those, those identities. And that's a really important point. I think this might be um, our final question for today. There are many things that are happening in this current moment of time. When you take a look around at what's happening now, what concerns you? And conversely, what gives you hope? Yeah, so what concerns me is the question that has always really concerned me, right, is democratic, true democratic engagement and, and, and inclusion, you know? 
um, I'm always reminded of, you know, the quintessential black experiment, you know, but I look at my indigenous brothers and sisters as well. You know, I, I, I'm always reminded of the sort of historically disadvantaged and colonized peoples of these of this land in particular, you know, and I'm always wondering and thinking about, well, when will the day come, right, when we will truly be, you know, included in how we are to be governed, you know, when we will truly have say, you know, in our lives, you know, when we will have the, the true rights to self-determination and self-aspiration and so forth and so on. So that continues to be sort of, you know, the worry, if you will. Um, that's what keeps me going in all of the movements and in my research and what I do. But I guess to the other side of the question, the young folk, right? So I, I saw a video on Twitter and they had to have been kindergarten age or first grade and they were marching down. Now they were doing, you know, around their little block, you know, but I said, get out of here, get out of here. So the fact that people as young as that, you know, how could you not have hope with that? But then also go into some of the protests um, of late and seeing these large crowds. And, and it just seems to me that, you know, people are starting to sort of see, you know, beyond the blinders a little bit. And then also as state violence is starting at the protests themselves, right? Because now the protest has sort of become a site of awakening as well. Right. For a lot of white Americans in particular, when you think about what happened to the elderly gentleman in Buffalo. Right. So that's given me hope to some degree of uh, the, the, the large amount of protest and how the protest itself has become a site of awakening. But sadly, through the lens of violence again, you know, and, and it's unfortunate, you know, and also I'm thinking how President Trump cleared Lafayette Park. Right and how they had to again bump up violence you know and with the tear gas and, and and they brought in the bureau of justice the bureau of prisons and such and all of that but what was the response to it the next day more people came out to the protest right so all of this issuance of state violence right is just bringing out more people so it's it's becoming a site of consciousness in, in a sense unfortunately though through the issuance of violence but yeah We have another question. What would be your advice for students who experience battle fatigue after constantly trying to bring attention and change to these issues? And how can we continue to bring about change while also balancing self-care? Yeah, yeah. I think you gotta take moments where you just totally, you know, step away from it. You know, I had to do it these past couple of days. I've been to a, I've been to several of the protests, but I had to actually sit down and say to myself, okay, now we're still in this pandemic though, you know, because I was asked to speak at yet another rally and I was typing and then midway, <laughs> you're going to laugh, I caught and I said, okay, now wait a minute. <laughs> Did I contract it? You know, because now we're all hypochondriacs to some extent, you know, with this COVID-19 going on. And that, that was a moment in which I had to pause and say, wait a minute, you know, I have to, you know, practice some self care. So I think that there are moments in which you have to just pause and know when to just completely, you know, eject yourself from it with the understanding that you're going to be able to return to it, right? The movement is always going to be there waiting for you to come back because the work to some degree is never ending. And that's the thing about democracy. That's the thing about freedom. You have to fight to keep it alive. We have to fight to keep freedom there. You have to fight to keep democracy going. So the movement is going to always be there. You can take a rest. You can take a rest. Wonderful. So we have exhausted our list of, of questions. Um, Dr. Williams, I want to personally thank you. And on behalf of Augustana College, thank you for sharing with us today. This has been a wealth of information I think we are leaving here uh, enlightened, give us a lot to think about. The resources that you shared with us is certainly going to allow us to continue the conversation collectively, but to also do our own personal work. And so I wanna thank you for giving us some of the practical advice and those resources that will help us to continue to, to learn. You were the uh, first in a series of campus conversations that we're going to have uh, at Augustana around uh, racial justice and social change. And I will say, uh, from my perspective, you have set the bar high. And so 
uh, it is with great gratitude that I want to thank you for, for sharing uh, your time and your expertise with us this afternoon. For those who are on the call, I want to remind you of our next campus conversation. It will be June 30th at 1 o'clock p.m. Central Time, and that's going to be Dr. Drick Boyd, who will answer the question, uh, what are we learning uh, from this current state of affairs and from the, the deaths of uh, some of these people who are now, uh, you know, the names are, are very common uh, in, in the news and in conversation. So that'll be June 23rd at one o'clock PM um, Central Time. Uh, people are saying thank you so much for your, your time uh, today and for sharing your expertise with us. So thank you so much. And with that, we will, we will end the call. Thanks everybody for being here this afternoon. I hope to see you next week. Uh, on, on our next Zoom meeting. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, bye-bye.